You might have heard the advice that one should be writing in a series if one wants to earn a living as an author. And there is actually something to that. And today I am joined by Lindsay Baroka, who is a very successful fantasy author who earns a six-figure income a year from writing. If you're a fantasy author, then you've come to the right place. My name is Jesper, and between Autumn and myself, we've published more than 20 books, and it is our aim to use our experience to help you in your writing and marketing endeavors. So first of all, thank you for joining my, me here on uh, Am Writing Fantasy, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to talk about books and marketing and in series, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always a good topic to talk about. And, uh, but maybe, maybe you can say a bit about yourself, uh, your writing. And I also know that you're, well, are transitioning out of an old podcast and starting a new and so forth. So maybe we can just sort of give a bit of context for a start. Sure. I am um, mostly self-published. I have an audiobook publisher, but I started self-publishing at the end of 2010. Uh, when my first series was The Emperor's Edge, and I had uh, only two books written at that time, and they weren't in the same series. So I can talk to <laughs> what it is to start out without, you know, there's a lot more you can do with marketing when you have more. Um, it, I was a uh, pretty excited about it from the beginning. I saw the potential, even though I didn't make a lot of money to start with. You know, I, I think I was really excited when I made more than $100 a month. Uh, but as I got more books added in the series, I had people do fan art and um, they started, you know, doing some fan fiction and things like that. So I saw that people enjoyed my writing, uh, at least certain numbers of people, <laughs> the ones that you're, you're hoping to target. And so that was really reassuring. And I, I felt confident that eventually I could get to the point where I could make it my day job. And by the time I'd finished that series, I ended up doing about eight books. Uh, I was, you know, making, I think over 10,000 a month. And I thought to myself, well, if I could just keep doing that, that would be awesome. And uh, I could, you know, you have expenses too with edit paying editors and cover art and such. But uh, that was before anybody was spending much money on advertising. So that was mostly take home money. And um, I've since written numerous more fantasy series. I've also done some science fiction. Uh, if you take a peek at me when this podcast comes out, you'll see that I'm doing uh, my Star Kingdom sci-fi series, but uh, I, I'm kind of alternating next year, probably be back to dragons. So, um, and you asked about the podcast. We, uh, m myself, Joe Lalo and Jeff Poole did the science fiction and fantasy marketing podcast for over four years. We are kind of been winding it down this year. I was starting to feel that we had a message that could be for more than just sci-fi and fantasy authors. So uh, Joe and I are going to start a new one this summer called Six Figure Authors, where we kind of help people that want to get to that level. And even beyond, it is possible as a solo author, if you're prolific and <laughs> marketing and in a genre where it works that, you know, you can make a million dollars or more a year. So there's right now, it's a great time to be self-publishing or, <laughs> you know, just kind of managing your own future if uh, if you have any entrepreneurial spirit at all. And uh, as I'll be the first to admit, I like the writing more. I kind of do as much, you know, I learn as much marketing stuff as you have to, but uh, I think I'm kind of can demonstrate that you don't have to be a super pro at uh, Facebook ads or <laughs> AMS ads or anything like that. I'm just still fumbling my way a little bit with some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad to, uh, that you said about uh, that this is a good time to to get into or, or to publish in general or to, or to write books in general, because I I sometimes come across the line of thinking that, that people think like, well, isn't it a bit too late now? And of course, if we are comparing to, and I guess you have this from personal experience, but if we're comparing to like 2010, 2012, something like that, then for sure it is a different marketplace nowadays. But in the global view of things here with, with all the countries who, who doesn't even have eBooks or e-readers and all doing all of that yet, I, I, we're still sort of in the, in the early stages of this stuff. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? I do. And I often tell people when I started, it was December 2010. I thought I was too late. I was like, because Amanda Hawking had already made her like million dollars from, uh, you know, her paranormal romance books. And there were a few other people that got in really early and were killing it. And, and Kboards was around back then, uh, the Writers Cafe forum. And people were saying like, oh, it's getting a lot harder. <laughs> so I was like, well, well, we'll try to figure it out. Um, 
in the early days, you kind of had to go hunting on deviantart.com or somewhere or know an artist. There wasn't really this whole industry to support indie authors yet. You kind of had to find an editor that maybe could do fiction. Uh, my, my editor started out in the technical editing field. And so I was her, fir I was her first person doing like sci-fi and fantasy. And to this day, I think I'm one of her main people. Uh, she's still it's like, what is this term <laughs> that you're talking about? But um, so now at least it's, it's, there's a lot of great advice out there. There's a lot of sites for um, promoting your book if you've got a little money to spend uh, the social media stuff's a little more established so I, I do think you know you still see people that are just and maybe they started a couple years ago but they kind of figured it out with a new series or something and that's taken off for them so it's, it's very possible still here in uh, 2019 to to make a splash and uh, you, I feel you do have to pay attention and, and learn some of the marketing stuff it, it's you're probably not going to just throw a book up and get lucky no, by yeah. having it in the right category. Um, you saw more of that early on, especially, you know, if a new category popped up on Amazon that hadn't been served by traditional publishing, if you just threw something up there with a horrible cover, <laughs> it didn't matter. People would give it a try. And yeah. those days are probably gone. Yeah, true. Yeah. I mean, and in that way, it is a different marketplace now, but, but, uh, but I, I, okay. But I guess at the end of the day, one should also say that, uh, you know, if, if you want to get into writing because you want to earn money, then I, I think there is, there's a lot of different professions that will get you money way quicker than writing books. So in that way, it's, it's not the, the right motivation is not because you want to earn money. I think the right motivation is because you love, love writing and, and you love telling stories and that, that should be the main driver. But then, uh, of course, you need to couple it with, with some advertising. But, but I guess then... Uh, coming back to sort of the main topic here, because now that we are talking about advertising and one of the often made arguments about uh, it's better to write in a series rather than writing standalone books is because of course you can sort of push a bit more marketing budget against a, the first book in a series because then people will go on to read the other ones. But I know you've written quite a lot of series, so I'm curious to, to have your inputs or, or views on, on well, well, I guess on one hand, how do you decide when when is the time to stop a series, but also what have you seen from when you're comparing your series to your standalones? Can, can you still make a standalone work well, or is it sort of doomed in today's day and age if you do that? It's a little tougher if you have a fan base built up and they'll just, you're lucky enough that they'll try anything new you put out and I have a, a standalone I did last year, sci-fi, um, that did pretty well. Um, you know, it, it certainly more than covered its costs and the time I put into it. Uh, but knowing me, I always end up like wanting to write two or three more and the, the readers always want more too. So I have very few actual standalones that are still standalone. Um, my Dragon Blood series, which has eight books, a spinoff book, uh, and a spinoff series of five books, that started as a standalone. I had no mm. intention of writing. I was just like, I'm just going to sweet little fantasy romance with magic and it'll just be a nice side thing. And uh, I really enjoyed the characters, which is what happens. I tend to fall in love with the characters and hopefully the readers do too. And I always end up doing more. And you're right on the advertising. If you're going to spend money on a book one, you know, especially if you're thinking maybe I'll make it free or 99 cents as a way to kind of lower the barrier of entry, then um, it, it helps if you have seven more books at 4.99 that people will hopefully get sucked into the series and continue on to purchase. Mm. I'm not super calculating as far as like, oh, well, like last year I actually had a series that did quite well that was a uh, Heritage of Power. It was that spinoff series in that world where I already had a lot of readers and I wrote five of them and they were still selling really well. And I, I remember thinking, you know, I should just keep writing more of these. And <laughs> But I kind of planned a five book story arc. Actually, I planned a three book story arc and <laughs> it turned into five. <laughs> so, and I'm not really someone that can just go, well, let's just take these characters and keep writing more of them, even though I've sort of solved the overarching story plot. So I was already moving on to something else. And um, then that's something people can decide for themselves. I, I do try to write I like the um, to do like three before I launch anything because it lets me really get into the story and I'm committed before, you know, because sometimes if it doesn't sell well, you can get discouraged or even if it sells okay, but not nearly as well as something else you've done. 
uh, that can also be like you're always comparing either against other authors or your own past successes. So it can be a challenge to um, stay enthused if something doesn't do as well. So I like kind of committing beforehand to like, you know, I think this is going to be at least five books and, uh, we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes from there. I, I feel lucky enough to have readers that I know I'm not going to lose money on a series or because you know, they'll try anything new. So that's a nice place to get to. I, I know that's not everybody yet. But I do think it's worth doing, maybe committing to three books there, you know, especially if you're newer and don't, you're still kind of figuring out the marketing stuff. Maybe you can afford super, you know, like custom illustrated cover art, which is always great in like epic fantasy if you can have a illustration, but that can be $800 or more. So not everybody can start out with that. And so if you don't have a real co killer covers to start with, that can be a little tough if you're not really great at writing blurbs yet you're still learning how to do that uh, you can kind of unknowingly sabotage your series so you want to give it a bit of a chance and then i always say like before you abandon it you know try try getting new covers ask for opinions you know because a lot of people really struggle with blurbs uh, i can't tell you how many i've looked at as a, just as a reader looking for something to read and i'm like it's just kind of it'll be a little choppy or it doesn't mm. quite make sense and it's probably because they edit it so much that it became less natural. So there are definitely challenges when you're starting out. And uh, sometimes it's the second or third series that does well for you and takes off. It's often actually a bit difficult to figure out what will sort of resonate with the with the readers out there and and what will not. Um, I, I, don't, I mean, I talked to Dave Chesson quite recently, of course, and he has his publisher Rocket uh, software that sort of can help you figure out if if there's a market for certain book ideas but i've always been more of the line of thinking that i write the story that i'm excited about writing and then maybe it'll take off maybe it won't but maybe then the next one will but i i, I don't know that that's sort of my my line of thinking on it and i guess one could be smarter and uh, research the market very specifically figure out what people want and then write that but i i don't know I, i've never really been a prescribe it to that mythology. I'm not any good at it. So I don't either like I, you know, I think if you can, I think you can write to market if you happen to be the market yourself, like you love those vampire romance <laughs> novels that sell like crazy. I, I'm kind of one that wants to subvert the tropes rather than doing what's super popular. So I've just found that even if I, sometimes I think before I write a series, you know, this one, I think it's got a few, you know, enough things that are popular and like epic fantasy that maybe it'll take off. And then inevitably that one, it's just, you know, it does okay. But, and then it'll be a series where I wasn't expecting that much from it and that will end up doing better. And I'm kind of reassured because I think traditional publishing has the same experience there. They also seem to not be very good at predicting which things will end up, you know, they end up calling them a sleeper hit because they didn't expect that one to do well, you know, and then sometimes you push something really hard and it's just, it doesn't click with people. And yeah, I think you can get better at predicting what, well, you know, what's going to do well, but usually I can tell in hindsight why something did well, but not necessarily as far as sitting down and planning, like, oh, I'm trying to write the next big hit. Uh, I'm just happy to, like you, I, I think it's important to write what you're really excited about. And then you can figure out how to try to market it in the best way that has the best chance to do well. Like, you know, you can put a dragon on the front cover if there was a dragon in chapter eight. You know, and, and hopefully, <laughs> that always helps uh, with a dragon. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the traditional fantasy symbol that uh, people see and get excited about. And they're like, oh, that's my kind of book. Yeah, indeed. But if, we, if we're saying that committing to at least a trilogy then is, is sort of the advice, um, have you had any uh, success in, for example, having, okay, so you've written a, a trilogy, but it's not really taking off and then you're rebranding it with new covers and, and new blurbs and stuff. Have you had success in actually making such a story uh, sell, whereas before it actually didn't? And what I'm hinting at here is that the actual story is actually okay, but it was just a wrapping around it, meaning the covers and the blurbs and stuff that really didn't work. I've seen it happen a lot for other people. Um, my first series actually did not have very good covers that were, 
you know, I remember the, uh, the Emperor's Edge was my first series in kind of a high fantasy steam era kind of thing. So not only did it not quite fit epic fantasy or steampunk, <laughs> it was kind of in the middle. I had these covers that, uh, I don't know, somebody said, is this historical Indian fiction? Because there were these yellow covers and apparently that's what it put them in mind of. <laughs> and I, I agree looking back that they weren't super, you know, they didn't scream epic fantasy, um, but I was always willing to make the first book free and run sales. And I feel that the story pulled people in well enough that if they would just give it a try, they would, you know, enjoy it. And I didn't have like super hot success, right? Like I said, right from the start, but I was always willing to like run those, you know, make this free, run a promo, just give away the first book to try to get people to try it. And I was lucky enough that you know, enough people like the story, and I think the word of mouth helped a little bit too. Uh, that still seems to be a fan favorite, that that first series. So if you're not super to market and you don't have the exact, you know, perfect cover, it's more of a challenge. Uh, and I think you might have to be willing to do the free book one or, you know, to try to lure people in and then hope the story is strong enough to uh, to get them in there. But if you know better and can just make it all awesome from the start, your odds are, of course, better. And uh, I have seen other people where they recovered it and kind of relaunched the series uh, that suddenly they gained some traction. And um, with mine, I put new covers on it eventually. Uh, it wasn't really a game changer, at, but it's it made it easier to get BookBub ads on the box set. <laughs> so that's always a plus if you can get some of one of those a year, mm, but they're, getting, yeah. they're getting tougher to get. So even for established authors. And I was thinking, because I, I know I've noticed that you have quite some, some uh, series data, the first book in a series that are free. Uh, and I've also noticed actually, I think you have some full trilogies that are free as well, but do you have a, like a conscious strategy about what you're making free and why and so forth? Or, or how do you, how do you decide what to charge for and what to make free? I usually don't start out with book one free, but I'll often launch at 99 cents. It's just so it's, uh, you know, people will check it out. And then um, it's usually after the series is complete. Like uh, most of the ones where I have a free book one that's always free, it's like an eight book series. And so there's seven more and usually some spinoff stuff. So if I suck them in with the first one, then uh, they'll go give it a try. And then I will often box up the first three books in the series. I find that um, if people read the first three books, they're even more committed to going on and finishing the series than if they just try the first one. And I don't usually leave those free. That's sort of like if I got a book bub a few months ago, I made it free for the book bub. And then it's just kind of a pain to, to go back in and, and yeah. Amazon takes, <laughs> like I have one right now that I think it's free on Amazon, even though I put the price up on the other sites and it's like, oh, okay. Um, but so I will usually do those for sales, uh, do like the first three books. And again, in a series where there's like eight, so there's still a lot of stuff for them to go on and pay for if they wish to. I've also sort of tried to use the uh, book one free or I have my first uh, book in, in the series for free as well. Just because as, as I think you said earlier, it, it just lowers the, the resistance and the barrier for new readers to, to actually give it a, a chance. Um, and in that way, it, it works. I, and I still believe in here in 2019 that, that the free starter still works. I think especially on the non-Amazon sites, for those who are not exclusive and, and want to sell on Barnes and & Noble and Kobo and Apple, that um, those people don't have a subscription service yet, like KU, Kindle Unlimited on Amazon. So they're, they're still, I feel like a lot of people surfing, looking for the free books on those sites. I even had somebody the other day say they grabbed my free book one on Smashwords, which I was like, wow, I didn't know people <laughs> were still shopping there. <laughs> but I, I think the international crowd that maybe doesn't have a local Amazon you know, in their country, uh, you might be able to, they might still use uh, Smashwords and you know, some people just like that there's no DRM and, and all that stuff to deal with on those sites. But I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, free working. Yeah. So I, I feel like on Amazon, Kindle Unlimited has maybe replaced it a little bit uh, because those people kind of have their $10 a month subscription and they don't think about it. That just automatically comes out of their account and everything in Kindle Unlimited at that point is essentially free for them. So they can just shop from that store. But I still find that when I do a free run on um Amazon, 
that I can get some some new readers checking them out. Uh, I, I've, I'm surprised at how many people have come in from the free promo sites that they'll say like, oh, I found your book first on free booksy or, or bookbub. Cause I, I feel like authors are saying, oh, those don't work anymore or they don't work as well as they used to. But I think there's still a lot of readers subscribe to it that, you know, they, they read a lot, they want bargain books. And as indie authors, even if we, price at $4.99, we're still a bargain compared to $9.99 or $14.99 from traditional publishing. So I, I am still a fan of free. Like I'm happy if I can get my stuff into libraries and you know people can read them that way. Because people that buy, you know, even if they download your stuff for free, they may still tell a friend and, and share the story with somebody who's going to go pay for it. And so that's why I've never been bothered by, you know, at least sharing, uh, most of my book ones end up being a complete a story so it's not like they have to read on but I do try to set up a bigger story arc to kind of draw them in and there's questions that aren't answered about the characters so because I think if you give them just a complete book that ends then <laughs> there's like more friction they're not necessarily going to automatically just continue on with the next one yeah but hopefully if they love the characters they will but yeah and then the cliffhangers of course you, you can you can use those as well just to uh gets people into the uh, next book in the series as well. Yeah, I, I often, I, sh I don't like to do those, but somehow it ends up being kind of a cliffhanger. Like I try to do a complete story in the novel, but then it's obvious there's more things that the characters have to go and deal with. Uh, especially in fantasy, I think that we just tell these massive sprawling stories that at the end, it's a whole different like government system, you know, yeah. <laughs> that had to be put in place. It's not like this, it's not just a little romance usually. It's this span, you know, epic spanning scope. <laughs> uh, we'll pretend that made sense. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Um, but I was thinking as well, because uh, we talked about the free starter, but on the opposite end of the scale is, is uh, the, let's say, more expensive uh, pricing element. And I talked to uh, Joseph Malik recently as well, because he uh, actually increased the prices of all his books to $9.99. And it was quite interesting conversation because he was telling me that in terms of actual unit sales, there was no difference from when he had the lower price point. Um, and so basically he's just increased all his revenues, but he's not selling any less amount of books. And it also, of course, enables him to, to spend a bit more money on the advertising because he can afford it. But uh, have you played around with the price ranges on your books to see if it makes a difference in that way? At one point, I went up from doing a lot of them at three ninety nine up to four ninety nine. I am conscious that uh, I publish pretty often, so if somebody is going to come in and read everything I published that year, it might be like ten novels. So I, I would feel that it might be harder for them to buy everything if I made it something $10. And I've certainly heard from a lot of people, they're like, well, I'm kind of on a budget, you know, I'm retired, I have a set income. So I really appreciate that your books are affordable. Uh, and in my case, I make plenty. Uh, so I'm not like, you know, I don't feel like I need to make more just because I have so many books out now that, uh, and I managed to keep the backlist selling reasonably well. And I almost always have a new series uh, each year. So, um, you know, if, if you want to try it and it works, there's nothing wrong with that. I think I we had Joseph on the show. I think he kind of does like one book a year or something in that yeah, range. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I think you might have diminishing returns if you've published really often at that price point. Where um, it, it depends on how prolific you are, too. I know with Epic Fantasy, you can be doing these 200,000 word novels and you're not going to be publishing as often. So um, I am a big fan of looking at the overall income rather than worrying too much about what one book costs. That's why I'm, I'm happy to do 99 cents or free for a book one if it means I make more overall. And, um, you know, I, I, I like that I less than traditional publishing. I feel like that's a real advantage for us. And when I still make 70%, yeah, that's that seems like a really, you know, making $3, 350 per per ebook seems good if you as long as you're selling you know, lots of copies. <laughs> if you're selling three copies a month, then, uh, you know, it's a little more frustrating and, you know, you might want to yeah. play around with all kinds of price points. Yeah, but maybe. I mean, if you're selling three copies, then three ninety nine or nine ninety nine doesn't really make much of a difference, except that one more cup of coffee you can buy that month, but otherwise it doesn't make much of a difference, I guess. 
It depends also if you're in Kindle Unlimited uh, and people can borrow them. I, I've noticed that the higher price points can actually be more appealing then because they feel like, oh, I'm getting a really good deal because I can just borrow this $6.99 book instead of having to pay for it. Whereas if it's 99 cents, they might just go, well, I'll either buy that or maybe I won't get that one because it's it's not as a good of a deal for one of my 10 borrows that I can have at a time. So that's uh, something to consider too. Mm. Okay, so uh, I guess at least um, what I get from, from all of this is that for sure it is still advisable that uh, people should be writing in series. I, I think we settled on that uh, give it at least commitment for to write three books before you sort of abandon it and write something else. And, and I guess also based on you, what you're doing here that sometimes it almost sounds like sometimes you're just writing a, a book and then you, uh, you just make sure that the ending is at least open enough that if, if people like it, you can write on. But it almost sounds like many of your series have sort of stuck out of just one book then then happen to <laughs> get extended into a, a full series. Is that, is that right? I think the Dragonblood series is the only one where I didn't at all, wasn't planning to do a series. And then I've got a, a little box set that's two books where um, the first one was encrypted and I totally meant that to be a standalone. And then people liked it and I was curious what happened next with the characters. So I turned that into a two book thing. So it got a sequel and a short story. Generally now, no, you know, with experience on my side, <laughs> I will plan out something that can go to five or eight books. And I will plan from the start for it to have like, there's questions about the hero or maybe the villain that you're not gonna get the answers to right away. So that will make the reader curious and want to read on. And there's there's some something going on that needs to be resolved. Uh, like I did one sci-fi series where the, the heroine was trying to search for her daughter that was missing and that took it through all eight books, poor kid, <laughs> no. never got to get found. <laughs> so like, even though there were individual stories and you'll see that a lot on TV series too, where there's sort of like this one thing where they're trying to accomplish in the end, solve some crime or something, you know? And I think that if you design it that way from the beginning, with a few little things like that, that people want to see resolved, it keeps them reading. I know I'm reading something right now where I think I'm only reading because I want to see the character become the thing, you know, she's trying to become a knight. <laughs> it's like, these are okay, but you know, I'm not sure if I would keep reading if it had been a complete story in one book. So sometimes right. just that stuff can keep people going on, even if maybe there's some other stuff that wouldn't have made them a super fan. And then by the end, maybe they've become more bigger fans of the series. So. Mm. And and I, we also have a very uh, binge sort of watching, reading, um, what's it called, like mentality, but the uh, culture nowadays. And being in Kindle Unlimited, I, I guess that helps. But uh, do you have all your books in, or most of your books in Kindle Unlimited? Or how, how do you do the split between wide and, and Kindle Unlimited? All of my older stuff or older series are, are wide because I started publishing before Kindle Unlimited and KDP Select existed. Right. So I really resisted for a long time. I didn't want to go into the Amazon exclusivity with anything. And I finally saw that it was an advantage to be in there and kind of a disadvantage not to be in there since the borrows also count as sales as far as calculating your sales rank and whether you're going to be in the top 100 of your genre thing. So, cause I know if you pop into like Epic Fantasy, you'll kind of look through and unless it's a big traditionally published author, chances are the books are in Kindle Unlimited. There are very few people who are able to make it and kind of stay in that top 100 for a while if they're not in Kindle Unlimited. So I started launching new series in there. And so they might stay there for a year or so. And then when I have something new, I'm gonna start, I'll move that series wide and, and kind of do a, like a second launch, I guess, <laughs> you know, right. make, one free or 99 cents and run some promos again. It's sort of an opportunity to say, oh, hey, I'm launching now on Kobo and Apple and all the other bookstores. So it's not the ideal thing. You know, I think the, right now people are making more money by being exclusive with Amazon, which is, seems counterintuitive and we will find it tough to jump. Uh, I've heard from, uh, you know, like Kobo and stuff, like the worst thing you can do is kind of jump back and forth. Yeah. I, so I just I was started in KU and then move it out and then it's going to stay out. I'm not going to like yank it and try to put something back in KU. So I'm it's usually the most recent series is in there. And then, um, yeah, just leave, put the other stuff wide. And I also do a, a Patreon 
for the sole purpose of putting my books out early before I en uh, enroll them in KDP Select. So the fans that are not Amazon people can, if they're willing to download it from Book Funnel, uh, and you know, I announce it on Patreon. They can get the books early. I usually put them a week or two up uh, before they, before they launch. So that's sort of how I'm working around <laughs> right now. Because the problem with starting out wide is you have fans on the other site, and they get grumpy when, understandably so, yeah. when they find out your new book is only on Amazon. So it's this is a little bit of a challenge. I uh, I'm would certainly love it if Amazon removed the exclusivity requirement. So I, I don't have any problem with people getting it as a subscription thing, that doesn't bother me. I, I still make money on that, but they, they do make it tough by not allowing you to have it anywhere else or even sell it on your own site. I, I'm not, I have not and will not put any of my books uh, in Kindle Unlimited, but, uh, but uh, yeah, that's a whole other story that I've talked about pre previously. So uh, we'll leave that alone for now. Um, but I was wondering now that, um, now that I have you here and uh, we've, we've sort of talked around the, the, the series and the importance of writing in series, but because because you're also a six-figure author, I'm wondering if, if sort of you have any advice for sort of the different stages people go through to get to that level. Uh, you know, is, is there any good advice for beginners versus uh, when, once you maybe pass that 10K mark and, and so forth? Is there any any sort of a, the best uh, the best advice for, for, for those uh, stages of writing? I think if you kind of keep your expectations low and just, you know, because I feel like people get so disappointed if they're, they're new and they see how much you can possibly make, but their book doesn't do, or, or their book maybe even does okay. You know, they're like, oh, I made $500 this month. That's, that's horrible because this other person's making $5,000 in my genre. So I always had the kind of low expectations. Like I thought maybe if I got enough books out, I could eventually do this for my day job. So um, it's. I think it's kind of tough actually when you have success right out of the gates because then you think it's always gonna be that easy. And, and I've seen now, I've had the opportunity to see a lot of authors disappear. Like they had one series that took off and then their next two series flopped and then they're just gone now. So I think it's uh, probably not bad if you just kind of gradually you know, put more books out. Every time you put a new book out, it gives you an opportunity to, you know, have a sale on book one. And I just think of it in terms of I'm trying to get a few few more readers with each new book I launch. And uh, hopefully they'll become lifetime readers. I, I've, I don't know. I think I have maybe 60 novels now between my name and I did like 15 under a pen name. And I have readers that tell me regularly that they've read every single one. And I'm a, I'm just amazed. I'm like I don't I haven't even gone back and like <laughs> read a lot of them as, as just as a reader. Um, so that's great. And then you know uh, of course if you do start making some money, make sure it, you know it's going to be different in every country how much you need to put aside for taxes. But uh, the government will want their portion, and it, it can be pretty high when you get up into six figures. They they you know at least in the U.S. they do your, your tax bracket based on you know, what your income was. Mm -hmm. So make sure to put money aside for that. And um, you have to hear, you have to be able to pay for health care on your own. Uh, I know in some countries, that's what you get as a citizen that <laughs> pays taxes. Yeah. So <laughs> that's something to consider in the US and some other countries where you need to buy your own health insurance. So usually you need to make more as a self-employed person than you did maybe as a salaried person in order to cover all your expenses. So it, it's ideal if you can probably do both for a while and just pay off any debt you have before making the jump to full time. And, and then you'll probably find that there will be jumps. Like I thought, you know, income would just kind of steadily rise. Uh, but you tend to like something takes off, you know, a little bit and then you get a big jump and then you're at that level, hopefully, and you stay there. And then maybe the next series will be a bigger jump. It will, even, inevitably, it won't continue to just always trend upward. So it's it's good to put money in the bank and then not assume that you're just always going to make the same level every year. I, I tend to pay for things with cash just so I don't even have to worry about it. You know, like don't mm -hmm. you know I don't want a big mortgage on a house or anything like that. So I I, I feel like if you have gradual success, you're probably going to handle it better than if you just suddenly start making a hundred thousand from your you know some trilogy that took off like crazy. So, but you know, who, who wouldn't hope for that to happen? Yeah, I guess I can't blame anybody from hoping that. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot for all your advice here, Lindsay. Um, 
where can people find out more about you if, if they want to, to learn about your writing or, or your podcast or, or whatever? I'm on lindsaybaroker.com. If you come anywhere close to spelling my name, you'll probably find it. It's, it's, Google can help. <laughs> it's, it's not too common of a URL. So uh, that's my website. I'm on Twitter as Goblin Writer, which is the kind of handle you get if you have had it for 10 years before you started publishing and you, <laughs> you weren't thinking like, oh, I need a professional author thing. And then under Lindsay Baroker on Facebook and also on Instagram and uh the, the new podcast is going to be sixfigureauthors.com with the number six, because that is the domain that was available. So hopefully we'll, we're going to do kind of a higher level, you know, just sort of skip the basics because there's a lot of podcasts that, you know, do some of the basic stuff. And we'll try to get on some really successful guests and just drill down and ask them the good questions. So if you're a podcast listener or on YouTube, hope you check us out. That's great. And thank you so much for coming on to Am Writing Fantasy, Lindsay, and, and have a chat here today. Thank you for having me. And to you out there, thank you for watching and see you next Monday.